Welcome to this week's episode of Leaders on a Mission, where I'm joined by inspiring leaders driven by the impact of creating a healthy and sustainable world. And in today's episode, I'm joined by Michelle Zhu, CEO and co-founder of Hue. Now, Hue are a mission-driven biotech startup, pioneering a sustainable production of bio-based dyes, helping reduce harmful environment of of say the textile dyeing industry and um you know I, I noticed as well just like kind of researching i think it was the time best innovation of 2021 so look michelle you've obviously done some great work over the last few years and uh super appreciate you joining the show and uh having you on today thanks simon i really am excited to be here excellent excellent so let's take it back i'm really interested in just i suppose understanding you know some of the key forces you know maybe the earlier upbringing the key forces that helped shape you know who you are today mm. um well you know I think if I had to point to you know just like really narrow it down I I have to kind of give a lot of par um a lot of credit to my parents um you know we're immigrants from China moved here when you know I was three years old um and and that's when they became entrepreneurs and started building their own business and a very big kind of influence in my early years was really um watching them build their own ironically apparel business um that uh just yeah I mean left a huge impact on me in in, in so many ways that we can, you know, delve into, but, you know, it included, I think, more on the kind of um, sort of personal side, right, like, you know, being the last person to be picked up from school and spending a lot of my weekends in their office, like climbing the boxes in their warehouse and, right, and, and I think just because of those experiences, I think that left a really um, strong impression of kind of notions of like hard work and perseverance and um, giving all that you can to your company. Um, and, and, and so those are some of the things that I saw, but I think also, and, and, and I will say like, those are things that I'm working through in terms of both positive and, you know, potentially, you know, damaging, right, impacts um, on kind of the, the psychology of kind of being a founder myself now. But, but, but I will say kind of to their credit, I think they were also very intentional about kind of the messages that and, and values that they instilled in me. And I think some of the, you know, largest ones that come to mind are also things like, um, you know, the, the, the importance of like, individuals reaching their your full potential um and I know that sounds weird but you know just this like if you are a capable person you have a responsibility to make impact with it um I think that's a, that's a really big one and and then and then the other one that I definitely always come back to is like the the just just doing things with integrity. And so even though they are business people and entrepreneurs, not focusing on money, but just focusing on doing what's right and building things kind of the right way. And, um, and so that just, all of that had such a big impact on me, I think, growing up and even more so in ways that um, I've been surprised by, but um, maybe shouldn't be um, just even more so in recent years as I've been building Hue. Great. Well, they sound like fantastic, um, fantastic role models. And um, and tell me, though, career wise, you know, as you were kind of, you know, I suppose, you know, uh, finishing grad school and considering what you wanted to do, you know, yeah, what, what were your, um, yeah, how did you think about your career at that point, as it were, and what you wanted to do with your, you know, with yourself? Yeah, so, I mean, I, you know, I think you might be surprised to hear, but like, actually maybe because of those experiences of watching my parents you know just pour their heart and soul into their business I actually never thought I'd be an entrepreneur I was like that's that's probably you know I, I want to take a different path right and um but but I did I did study business in college I you know I I, I didn't do a you know grad school degree I was you know the the kind of you know um business person 
Uh, but I will say kind of in a kind of undergraduate kind of business school education, um, I was probably that like rare breed of person who just like always was looking to challenge myself. Like if you look on my degree, it's like finance and math and economics. Um, but sort of in the background, I also really made a point of like really enjoying, you know, arts and sciences and you know, political science, thinking about people. And I think that probably is reflective of um, uh, just like the very diverse kind of set of interests I, I've always had, which probably just meant that, you know, finishing up a kind of business study, um, I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so like a lot of people who, you know, have kind of like that generalist background, that ended up bringing me to kind of the world of um, management consulting, um, where, you know, I got a lot of exposure to just different types of business projects and different types of industries really quickly, working with, um, you know, just some of the, you know, top and largest companies in the world, right, and and getting that exposure to, you know, what is it, what does it mean to be kind of thinking like an executive? Um, and I think from there, um, you know, I think it was very clear that after a, a, a while in kind of management consulting, you were really kind of focused on, you know, sort of being in your ivory tower, doing the one off projects, kind of parachuting in and then leaving. Right. And and I was really both curious about, I think, the um, at, at that time I was in the Midwest. So I was really you know curious about kind of the opportunity in the Bay Area, the kind of, you know, um, a kind of scene here that was a little bit more entrepreneurial. And then also um, just the opportunity to kind of work in a smaller company, work in tech um, and, and having kind of more ownership. So that brought me to a business operations role um, at Yelp, where, you know, I think that was really great too. You know, I think it was really the kind of opportunity to get deep into like understanding like how a company works, you know, all of the deep like people and the systems that help to make it run what builds great teams what fosters and and you know and and also what erodes culture and so um I think that was a really helpful kind of opportunity and I think also source of inspiration to kind of um I think really round out my perspective on kind of building a business and so then in early 2019 I promise I'm getting to you know the, the start of you here as I was kind of thinking about what I wanted to do next, that's actually when I was um, catching up with my then friend and then now co-founder, Tammy, um, who was graduating from her PhD at Berkeley um, and was looking to spin out the technology from her thesis work. And really that was the beginning of Hue. Um, and, uh, you know, as you, you know, you, you might be able to tell kind of from my story, I think, you know, there was part of, you know, that opportunity um, beyond kind of family background that I can also talk about, but but it was that opportunity to kind of get to, you know, instead of being the management consultant, get to kind of shape my own strategy and also get to build my own culture and get the chance to kind of um, rethink, right, what does like a radically different and impactful focus organization look like in, in, in essence, kind of what does a company of the future look like? And so that was that was really exciting to me. But of course, the other side of it was also the full circle connection to my own family background. Amazing, amazing. Well, so tell us um, um, about Hugh then and, uh, you know, what you do and what problems you solve. Yeah. Um, so, so Hugh's mission is to culture nature's rainbow. Um, as we like to say, which means we're using biotechnology to um, create cleaner sources of color for the many industries that are shaping the future of the planet. And that is starting in particular in fashion and um, with the blue dye, right, in everyone's jeans, everyone's favorite kind of wardrobe staple. Um, so using the foundation of Tammy's research in her PhD, um, we're basically creating a platform for using microbes and nature's blueprint to create color. And, um, you know, as we kind of take a pause and look all around us, you realize color is everywhere. It, it, it isn't just in, um, you know, our clothes, but it's in the food that we eat. It's in the paint on our walls, right? And, and today, all of that color is created by 
um, carbon intensive and often even toxic petrochemicals and dyes and dyeing are particularly notorious as a challenge for the fashion industry where, you know, something like 17% of global industrial water pollution actually comes from textile dyeing. And so our focus at Hue is creating drop-in bio replacements for industrial colors that can have a fraction of the carbon and toxicity footprint compared to traditional um, petrochemicals and without the trade-off in performance. Amazing. I'm just thinking when you go from a generalist kind of consulting business operations into the world of microbial fermentation and um, kind of biotechnology, that must have been some journey over the last four years, right? Absolutely, it was. Um, I think if there is kind of the number one thing, right, that I took from consulting, it was just the ability to learn and soak up information totally new, really, really fast. And so I definitely had to kind of flex those muscles coming into kind of building a um, a, a biotech company. And I think, yeah, I think my team would say, you know, I, I definitely know enough to be dangerous and the, and the group of scientists. And for a long time, we were, you know, I was like 10 to one right outnumbered in terms of uh, technical to commercial kind of representation in our company. Um, I, but, I, but I really tried hard to not be, you know, the kind of CEO who, um, who, uh, only knows business and doesn't kind of care about the technology because that is, of course, such a fundamental part of, um, you know, the the uh, the core of the business. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Did you have a scientific um, leaning at all then when you were? So I know you were very like majored in economics and kind of business, as it were. So how did yeah. you feel about science? You know, kind of growing up, as it were. Yeah, well, you know, the funny thing is, so so I did it not from a kind of personal education perspective, but the funny thing is I actually grew up in like a, a family of engineers. So my parents were actually both various types of, you know, engineers. Uh, my brother is now a biomedical engineer. My husband is um, also a kind of PhD in bioengineering. So um, in synthetic biology, he was the one who actually originally made the connection between myself and Tammy. So even though I wasn't um, kind of formally educated in the space, I think I was always attuned to the value of STEM and, and hard sciences and a great kind of admirer and appreciator of it. Fantastic, fantastic. Just give me one sec, Michelle. Sorry, I've just kind of plugged the cable in. And uh, oh yeah, no problem. Uh, one sec. Sorry. Nice. It's a really fascinating story. This it really is. You know, it's. Uh, and, uh, give me one sec. Yeah. No, take your time. I'll be like a few seconds. Okay. That's good. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I, I would have thought actually coming in that that relationship with Tammy was your friend beforehand. You know, there's mm -hmm. something else going to work with and being a partner with, right? So a friend doesn't always make a good uh, co-founder as well, right? Mm. So I would figure that relationship would have been really important for you, right? In in founding the company and you know as a, as a real building block. Yeah, absolutely. But I think, you know, when you're able to have a relationship someone bef with someone before you decide to kind of go into business with them, there's a lot of things that you have the privilege of knowing. And I think it's kind of, um, you know, up to individuals to be able to kind of understand what they're looking for in a business partner. And for me, it came down to, well, you know, one, of course, you know, foundationally, you know, knowing that she was a brilliant scientist, really smart, really capable, um, you know, and, and, and very willing to, you know, kind of put into the business, you know, blood, sweat and tears in the same way that I, you know, am. I think there's also, uh, I think, an even more important piece of this that has, I think, carried us through from the very beginning, which is that 
aligned sense of values. And, you know, as you can probably hear, that's just a really important part to me is being kind of values first leaders and understanding and, and getting to trust, you know, from the very beginning and knowing that Tammy was just fundamentally a really good person and that we would be building together this company with integrity. And, and, and that I think is more important than anything in terms of figuring out whether or not, you know, we're going to be compatible as business partners. Yeah, no, great. Absolutely. And so tell us a little bit about so the journey over the last four years, maybe just outline a couple of kind of key milestones or, you know, where you've taken the company. Well, you've started from scratch, but, you know, where you've got to on the journey so far, as it were. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it has been certainly like a it's been a it's been a big journey and it, it's often, you know, um, I, I often have to kind of remind myself, right, because there's there's always so much kind of to come. And yet it, it's a really good feeling to kind of get the chance to kind of take a step back and reflect a little bit and realize like and look back on everything that has already been done and how far you've come. Because I, I think something that, you know, I like to remind my team and, and that I think is often important to even remind myself is um, nobody can take that away from you. Like, you know, just being able to kind of build um, whatever, you know, we've built up until this point is is so huge. So just a little bit about the journey, I guess, you know, we, we started just, yeah, with two of us, you know, Tammy's work in grad school at Berkeley and 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 a dream and you know it was um us you know starting in the basement of indie bio you know sosv's you know biotech accelerator um and just trying to create the you know first early you know prototypes just you know proof of concepts to show like this this can be a thing and then you know from there after raising a little bit of kind of you know seed funding at the end of 2019 right starting to pull people together to create kind of iterative prototypes with increasingly kind of better performance um you know i feel like at this point we've probably increased our performance like <laughs> four or five x from that like early you know prototype that we had created in the you know in the basement of indie bio and then um you know over the the last couple of years right getting it to the place where we're um uh confirming and and um uh and and uh, yeah, confirming the process and then getting the chance to scale that and putting out our very first industrial quantities of dye and kind of along the way, of course, that that happened most recently, um, uh, you know, being also supported by additional funding in the form of kind of a series A, you know, financing that also helped us kind of scale to that next level and be able to kind of accomplish this milestone. So I would say those are probably kind of the, you know, the, the biggest moments thus far in terms of highlights on our journey. Journey, but it, it has certainly been um, a wild ride. Great. No, and congratulations. I was having a look through the um, the fundraising. And I, I hadn't come across Material Impact before. They led the, the round, didn't they? So uh, they look so interesting and so well aligned to, uh, to the journey. And I figure that, I mean, every single stage of fundraising is important, but having the right partners I'm going to share with you I mean there's probably nothing more important than that really in terms of being able to really realize the dream and ambition so uh, how did you find that whole that whole process the whole kind of um mm. yeah the whole raising yeah yeah and yeah we can definitely talk a little bit more about the kind of you know fundraising market and how it's changed too it's certainly been yeah that you know the fundraising process is probably one of the biggest kind of like testers, right, of like CEO um, resilience and kind of <laughs> perseverance, I think, um, you know, just through through the journey of, of building a company. But I couldn't agree with you more that I think when you find the right partners who are aligned, who really get it, um, it is really magical and and you realize i think that's been one of the biggest kind of changes in terms of how i approach the fundraising process right is um 
you're no longer as afraid to kind of hear no's, for example, through the process, because it's more about finding people and partners who really are kind of aligned with you in terms of vision for where they want the company to go, um, vision for, you know, the kind of values driven, you, you know, v- values aligned leadership that, you know, everybody kind of subscribes to together. Um, and so I, I think it's more about now, you know, being really confident in um, our approach and what we believe in and not trying to kind of cater to what is the story that investors want to hear, but rather just being really, um, really uncompromising about what is our story and how can we find the right partner who gets that and, you know, sees the world in the same way. And, and so I think we've really been lucky throughout kind of just the fundraising process. I mean, definitely SOSV, you know, through Indie Bio has been um, such a big supporter kind of round after round. Um, but also, you know, just in terms of fundraising timing, I mean, we raised our seed round basically right before COVID happened. And then we raised our Series A last year, basically just as markets were collapsing and we found great partners every time in that process that continue to kind of um, help kind of uh, give us what we need, I think, through that, those stages of of building. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think just kind of coming back to integrity during those fundraising processes has just been the biggest learning through it all. Absolutely. Luck or skill around the timing, would you say? Definitely luck. That one yeah. is a hundred percent. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and then I think the one other thing I'll say about that, right, as I'm thinking about, you know, I, I know entrepreneurs are, you know, bracing for challenging market kind of conditions right now. I think, I think one of the other things that I think I've really come to kind of appreciate is like, you know, you get more fearful of kind of challenging kind of economic markets when, you know, you're thinking about, um, you know, are you are you trying to build a company right or are you actually just trying to chase hype, right? And so um, I think like, you know, I, I strongly believe that if you're doing what needs to be done, right, for the company and you're hitting the same milestones, whatever is happening, you know, externally around you, I think the money will come. And in fact, it's more likely to be, you know, again, like the right type of support. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, no, the resilience thing is a, uh, it's an interesting one, because I, I would imagine when you first start, every no must just hurt a little bit. It must be a no is like, it's a rejection, right? I mean, it hurts. And I just wonder at what point that flips and you become resilient to it and you don't take it personally. Because uh, I just, I mean, a no is not nice to hear, right? Yeah, um, no, a- absolutely. Uh, and I think, right, especially for, you know, those of us out there who have people pleaser tendencies of which, you know, I absolutely consider myself to be one, like that is really, really hard. And I don't think, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, uh, I, you know, no's don't phase me anymore. And I'm totally, you know, resilient to that. But I, what I will say is like, I think it absolutely gets easier as you just get more iterations, but also as I think, your team grows, your kind of, you know, mission and what you're doing just gets more kind of confirmed through the process of building your company, your your conviction, at least, you know, I found that mine really has grown as well. And I think that is what has really given me the fire and courage to continue to kind of lean into what we're doing, why we're doing it and how we're doing it and, and be able to kind of, um, keep the confidence and courage about that to uh to kind of um continue to to carry us through you know fundraising um round after round that's that's great um can i be honest i i never realized just exactly i'm sitting here with my denims on and i never quite realized how you know i'd never even considered how much dye you know there was out there as a marketplace, especially the indigo dye for the gene, number one. Number two, I'd never considered how unsustainable it was. 
until I'd seen some of the kind of information on your, your website about just how poor it is from the environment, both, I think, from a water usage viewpoint and some of the kind of chemicals. They're the two main aspects around the unsustainability of the current process, right? Yeah, I mean, so, you know, we come back to the, I, I would say, so broadly speaking too, right, um, just putting it all in context, um, there is so much in fashion, uh, you know, and, and kind of, you know, manufacturing supply chains that I think need to be um reformed uh right and and you know we have built these systems uh you know upon kind of this um you know structure of kind of uh, you know likely right trying to kind of grow as quickly as possible you know and, and and all of that in ways that you know just didn't necessarily um uh i think um support uh, and encourage the the kind of best practices but i think now we're kind of at a place where, uh, you know, consumers and therefore the industries, the brands that serve them, I think are having this reconciliation moment where they're having to um, chase down the reforms um, because the, the, the consumers of tomorrow truly, truly care. And, and I think one of the biggest um, places for that in the fashion industry is denim, where it really has become kind of a poster child for some of the challenges. Um, and, I, and I bring all of that context because, honestly, there are so many, um, you know, challenges across kind of, uh, you know, sustainability in, in, in fashion. And I, you know, and I think this is another thing like, you know, that, that I've kind of learned throughout the years. I used to, I used to kind of wish that we were sort of like the one silver bullet and could paint that perfect picture that we're going to like solve everything in the world. And the truth is nothing like that exists. It is about an ecosystem of solutions and innovations kind of coming together to kind of solve the challenges within that supply chain. And so for us as Hue, yeah, we're focused on kind of one of the key areas of impact in fashion, which is kind of uh, dyes and dyeing uh, sustainability, but our focus is specifically creating the replacement uh, dye materials um, to be bio-based, um, kind of lower carbon, lower toxicity um, uh, substitutes for the uh, uh, for the vast quantities of kind of dye colorants that are kind of used in the industrial supply chain every day. Yeah, I got it. Jess, I won't draw too much on the technology, um, mm -hmm. but just to ask you, because I mean, it's interesting. I, I've come across many companies in the, I suppose, the uh, industrial biotech o over the years uh, that have looked at things like various chemicals and materials. And I, I haven't come across anything that's looked at this particular dye, um, you know, before. And I'm wondering, is the strength on the technology, is it around the microbe itself? And what you can get the microbe to do, for instance, is that is that really the core kind of component and differential? Yeah, I guess I would say I think that answer has probably changed as we've kind of grown as a company. Certainly, I think that was the core and foundation of the um, of the company was really all of that that Tammy had published and done during her PhD that was kind of focused on, you know, discovering the specific enzyme within the, um, you know, the Japanese indigo plant, for example, right? This is what I mean by taking that blueprint from nature and figuring out how to kind of harness that within a sp particular, you know, uh, strain, microbe and strain. Um, and that was sort of like the basis for mm -hmm. kind of what we were doing. But also I think then, as we've built our team and kind of grown as a company, I think our kind of secret um, to success has kind of grown beyond that. Not to say that that isn't still very much important, but just to say that like, you know, it just helps you appreciate like there are so many aspects beyond kind of an initial base patent or technology that helps to kind of make a company come together. And I think about, you know, our downstream processing team and our textile scientists mm. who've really come together to productize, right? Just the initial 
um, technology. And I think that's been a really big challenge for, you know, many industrial biotech companies is not just having this incredible strain and ability yeah. to right engineer microbes, but actually being able to turn it into tangible product in a really meaningful way that actually has the performance characteristics that the industry needs. I think those are pieces that we've really spent time over the last few years building in terms of capabilities at Hue that we really see as differentiators for, um, for us um, among kind of the industrial biotech space. Great, absolutely. Is that the most challenging part when you're, when you're kind of creating a, a product, as it were? Um, I would say, you know, that's probably been the biggest area of our focus. And maybe that is because when we started, we already had such a strong foundation with kind of, you know, the work that 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 Tammy had done that then the biggest pieces of kind of gaps in knowledge, right? Tammy wasn't a, you know, chemical engineer, didn't have those kind of downstream processing and, you know, textile science kind of like, um, you know, uh, background. Um, and so I think that was a big kind of gap in terms of early kind of knowledge building um, within our company. Um, and it's been kind of like a, a big area of focus for us kind of to date. Um, but I think also, you know, startups, as is natural with startups, um, the focus, the challenge kind of changes with every kind of phase, every season, every year, right, um, is uh, you know, it's always a new challenge as you kind of go into, um, you, you know, go, go into further growth. So, you know, first, when we were, you know, probably when we were first starting out, we would have never imagined putting out our first, you know, batches of industrial quantities of dye. That's crazy. And now we're thinking about, well, how do you go from a few hundred kilograms to dozens of metric tons and then eventually tens of thousands of metric tons, right? How, what kind of customer support and manufacturing infrastructure and financing needs to also come together at the same time to enable that so you can make that true kind of eventual impact on the broader industry. Wow, absolutely exciting times. And what, where, where is the... Where is the dream then for the company? You know, where, where where would you like to gravitate to over the next five years or so, ten years? Mm, yeah, I mean, I guess I would say, you know, to me, um, real kind of success for Hugh and the dream for Hugh would be just being able to, you know, have any of us right look around and just seeing many Hugh powered color products yeah. right in our homes around us um, and in our world around us um, I think we really have that aspiration to be the go-to color company for brand partners and also for you know consumers to recognize and help drive awareness um, and and be able to kind of put trust in the way that that our products um, are made and and that really maybe goes back to the point that you were kind of bringing up earlier that is kind of a gap between kind of now and the the future that we see which is that you're right a lot of consumers, a lot of people don't even realize the environmental impact of dyes and chemicals, right, that are going into the world kind of today. And, you know, I think we're thinking a lot about what's the role that Hugh can play to step out and no longer be another invisible chemicals company that are sort of polluting in the background, but rather focus on, um, you know, being a visible uh, you know, contributor and advocate to help to educate tomorrow's consumers and help to kind of change the way consumers shop and therefore the way kind of companies produce. Yeah, no, that's great. Let me just ask you, in terms of when you consider the, I suppose, the commercial or the, or the uh, commercialization or the route to market, uh, as it were, do you see longer term your customers being the you know, the, the, the branded manufacturers and you'll be selling your product directly to them? Or is it mainly to intermediates that are providing broader solutions to those clients? Or, yeah. Or, yeah. Yeah. So so we are, um, you know, a B2B company. Um, 
Uh, but we also like to say, you know, it's kind of B to B to C, where, you know, we have that focus on making sure that it isn't, you know, B to B to the intermediate so that we are the supplier to the supplier to the supplier that mm. stays invisible. We do want to focus on the messaging to consumers and on keeping with the cultural zeitgeist to help to kind of drive corporate purchasing decisions. Um, and so, yeah, I just come back to kind of the point of, you know, we don't want to be that ingredient company that is invisible. Color is the most visible ingredient, actually, in the products that we're, you know, using and consuming. And we want to help people know um, uh, the impact that it has and and to care um, about uh, what's going into, you know, what they're purchasing. And so I think that's a big driver of kind of wanting to make sure that Hugh has that direct relationship with the brands, right? The, the denim brands, the fashion companies, the consumer companies that everybody knows and loves rather than kind of being relegated to um, kind of an, an invisible supplier where there's just then that added element of pressure to kind of go back to the old ways of, hey, price is king, drive down, you know, as low as possible, and then, you know, the, really kind of erode your own kind of value as a company. Amazing. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. That's probably how the market's really shifted over the years as well. The, the more the pull through of the technology and the value proposition and the, that b 2 b to c play is a is a very interesting one at the moment. I, I'm picturing it now. I'm picturing going in there, buying some jeans off the shelf in a store with your label attached to the jean in a co-branded kind of way. That's how I'm kind of seeing it, as it were. Um, yeah, I think you got it. I think that's our our vision as well. And yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. That kind of trend and shift in the biotech industry is definitely something that we sense when we were kind of first starting out in building Q2. Um, and I think that's honestly one of the biggest values that, you know, we can bring as founders sort of to this space is, you know, be, beyond kind of uh, you know, I think it it comes back to that value of, you know, having diverse founders. What does it mean to be, you know, two women at the helm of kind of a industrial biotech company like this? Well, it's that connection to kind of the consumer pulse and the fashion industry um, and, and kind of understanding that and understanding the role that marketing, for example, has to play in kind of creating a successful business and momentum for uh, for for something like this um, that I think will will really help to kind of set you apart. Definitely, definitely. So I think here we've got a couple of things, I think, for Hugh moving forward. We've got the mission and the impact and the sustainability story. But then you've got quite a an interesting segment of the market and a, and a you know, it's a it's it's a it's a great industry to to work within, right? That it's an attractive industry to work within as well, in terms of, you know, where you're wanting to market and sell. So you've got a nice combination there of uh, of pull through, and uh, I'm I'm sure it'll be um, a fantastic journey over the next uh, few years, actually. And uh, I really appreciate you coming on today and uh, and sharing your journey. And a big congratulations on everything you've done, and wishing you the best for the future. Thanks so much, Simon. I had a lot of fun and thanks for having me.